Thank you very much, Ray. It's a real pleasure to be here. I just want to thank the uh, co-chairs organizing committee to include us in this venue, and and hopefully um, it's a sign uh, that uh, that you know we're being valued, and that uh, what we add to the patient is complementary to your care as opposed to competing. So. Uh, where we're going to go over the next 20 minutes is just to talk about uh, the specialties that we most commonly involve in the care of our patients who are faced with surgery, some of the current issues that we struggle with and that we have a lot of um, conversation with our colleagues about, and some examples of how we approach uh, and how we use a multidisciplinary approach to our patients, and then we'll wrap things up. So the specialties... Um, you know, it's a, it's a list that's well beyond this. I learned a long time ago to alphabetize rather than offend anyone. So, um, but uh, you'll see that we deal, uh, any one of these is the most important person we're dealing with at any given moment. And uh, uh, you'll see that in the operating room, the anesthesiologist, there's a new way that we're kind of approaching things that they become very critical to what we're trying to do. Our stomatherapist, who work with the patients beforehand to set expectations, and then afterwards, as they struggle sometimes with their stomas, Obviously, our, our GI colleagues and the hepatologists that we work with are, are critical to what it is that we do with these patients as we provide a, a global care for them. Our nurses and our, um, our uh, advanced practice providers are, are, are uh, as, you know, an integral part of what we do in the daily communication with the patients. And as you heard, oftentimes their relationship with the, uh, with the patients is much more uh, personal than anything that we could ever attain. Uh, we're seeing our nutritional support providers, whether it be our TPN folks or nutritionists, are uh, uh, involved on a frequent basis with the patients that we're dealing with. With the opioid epidemic that we have, our pain therapy uh, colleagues are, are integral to our management, as are the pathologists, uh, managing the patients in the perioperative period. And as you just heard, our uh, behavioral specialists, uh, without them, uh, sometimes there'd be no, no place for us to turn in some of the most desperate situations that we face. And then our radiology colleagues, obviously, that we work with, the social workers, and last but not least, our urologists, who oftentimes will help us during the operative case itself. So some of the issues that we really kind of um, struggle with the most, I think, and have the most conversation with our GI colleagues and others, uh, kind of focus on neoplasia, optimizing the patient during the perioperative or preoperative period, this uh, so-called ERAS, or enhanced recovery after surgery, approach to patient care, and then what do we do afterwards as far as our medications and how to best manage those. So we'll talk about each of those individually. Uh, neoplasia, we thought uh, we kind of had a handle on that, and those patients were coming to us until 2005. Scenic guidelines came out and turned everything on its ear. And uh, we now know that uh, a lot of these people are, are now best cared for by undergoing uh, high-definition chromoendoscopy by a, a skilled endoscopist with attempts at uh, endoscopic uh, removal of all uh, signs of the dysplasia and then just close surveillance. But still, having said that, there's, there's a lot of room and, and fodder for conversation related to these patients. Ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, the screening guidelines are similar, but once uh, we find something that's not amenable to endoscopic removal, what do we do? And there's a lot of debate as to how you manage these best given the different disease diagnoses and other confounding variables such as primary sclerosis and cholangitis, a lot of different variables. Dysplasia versus cancer, what operation do we do? Uh, what's the patient uh, coming into this? What kind of physiologic capacity do they have? What type of lifestyle are they looking for? All these things uh, have importance. Uh, for patients that have uh, malignancy complicating the rectum, uh, typically, we're going to use a radiation and chemotherapy up front for these individuals, uh, but we know that if they're looking for some type of sphincter-preserving procedure, that that pretty much obligates them uh, to avoiding or uh, going without this neoadjuvant therapy, which we know is associated with a decrease in the local recurrence of the tumor. So a lot that we think about in that, Roy. Right? And then last, uh, how do we preserve um, any kind of mucosa that's at risk? So in patients undergoing procedures for ulcerative colitis, um, do we leave that small anal transitional zone uh, or do we take it? Uh, in patients that have uh, neoplasia complicating their Crohn's disease with rectal sparing, do you leave the rectum, do you take it, and, uh, and then uh, subject them to lifelong uh, life with a stoma? And then lastly, how do you best survey these patients afterwards and what frequency and who should be doing all that? 
So optimization, uh, this is really a, a place that we focus a lot now. Uh, smoking cessation, as you heard Steve talk about, this is critical not only to recurrence in Crohn's disease, but optimizing uh, the patients as they, they face a big operation and uh, that's going to tax their, their lung or pulmonary capacities. So uh, we work a lot with smoking cessation. We need to correct deficits, whether it be uh, anemia, electrolyte deficiency, or uh, malnutrition, where we sometimes will... Uh, put patients on TPN for a period of time, not knowing really what the appropriate interval is until we really talk to our colleagues. Controlling sepsis, whether it be drainage or antibiotics alone. Frailty is something that we're now thinking a lot about and seeing a lot of uh, chatter um, and trying to uh, improve a patient's overall well-being prior to going into the operating room. And uh, then lastly, the management of medications, whether it be steroids, do we any, need to any longer um, steroid uh, uh, stress individuals? Do we need to uh, get them down to a more reasonable level? Biologic agents, you know, how long before we operate? Uh, should they be held? Does it matter? Are serum levels important? All these things we debate and, and talk about amongst ourselves. So this enhanced recovery after surgery is something that a lot of your surgeons are now uh, embracing. It's uh, really a, a worldwide uh, a notion. And basically it's that uh, by uh, using some evidence-based uh, approaches throughout the uh, perioperative period, we're able to get patients home much more rapidly and, uh, and completely um, unrelated to them getting out quickly, their complication rates are reduced. And we do that through a lot of different means, whether it be in the preoperative period, uh, during the operation, or the postoperative period. And it's all about setting things up appropriately. And here our colleagues, everybody... Uh, uh, talking about the same thing, it really helps to uh, keep the patients in the same mindset such that they can really benefit from this enhanced recovery process. Uh, as you uh, then move on to the post-operative period and handling the medications in that time, uh, corticosteroids, the, you know, what dose should patients uh, be on immediately after surgery? How quickly should they be tapered? Do they need to be tapered slowly or go right down to a physiologic dose? Narcotics, you know, it, it's a real problem that we have now with this enhanced recovery at our institution. Probably two-thirds of people are going home without ever seeing a narcotic. We have a very um, a dogmatic approach to our, our folks as far as in the preoperative period. We really minimize the use of opioids uh, in those individuals since they are such, uh, so prone to, uh, to addiction. And so it's really all hands on deck trying to address this situation. And then disease prophylaxis, uh, whether it be, is there any role in the patients uh, undergoing a restorative procedure for ulcerative colitis in trying to prevent the pouchitis that we know affects about half of individuals and Crohn's disease, obviously. Uh, we know that recurrence is going to happen. It's just how and when do we, we try to, to avoid that. So how can we do this? Well, there, there are some guidelines that are out there, and a lot of them uh, that we see from colleagues like Silvio and his associates uh, and ECHO, where they've come out with uh, multidisciplinary guidelines that are really helpful, whether it be on Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And you can see that in the UK, um, that, that there are some nice guidelines that look at quality metrics and uh, where you have uh, both the gastroenterologists and surgeons working uh, hand in hand to come up with these things. Unfortunately, in the United States, though, we're somewhat limited in what we have. And, and this is really the only guideline that I can find where you had uh, gastroenterologists, and that would be Bill Sanborn, Steve Hanauer, and Brian Fagan working with a surgeon, Vic Fazio, to come up with a guideline on the management of perianal Crohn's disease, you know, some 16 years ago. And uh, so there, there's really a lack. And I, I can tell you that from our organization that whenever we write these guidelines, uh, uh, it, it's, it's sad to say we don't reach out to our GI colleagues um, and include them in this, but I, I think that that's uh, something that we're working on, understanding that that's a, a fault that we've uh, perpetuated and that we need to stop, that uh, we need to include you in these types of guidelines uh, because what it is that you have to say um, is very important to how it is that we surgically manage these people. And uh, to that end, uh, recently the abdominal imaging people reached out to the AGA and uh, then representatives from uh, different organizations, whether it be in the adult or pediatric world, surgery, non-surgery, and came up with guidelines as to um, uh, MR and CT enterography for small bowel Crohn's disease. And I think that you'll see these being published uh, in the new calendar year, but uh, it's really been an onerous effort 
to get all these entities together and get them to agree, but, but it's happened and I think it'll be very helpful as we uh, interpret these imaging studies. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Amy Leitner, to, to continue on. Thank you. So I'll really be talking about the communication going forward with GI and surgery and other disciplines as well. You know, as the IBD patient becomes increasingly complex, I think our communication among different disciplines uh, becomes really crucial to optimizing patient outcomes and patient care. So how do we foster better interdisciplinary communication? There's three areas I'm gonna to highlight today to foster communication in the IBD patient. One is real-time communication between providers, so the surgeons and gastroenterologists talking in real time. Another is the formation of multidisciplinary clinics. And the third I'll talk about is the use of IBD multidisciplinary conferences. So first, real-time communication. There's a number of modes for us to communicate in real time. There's email and intraportal communication. There's electronic medical record system. You can pick up the telephone, your cell phone, and make a phone call to the other treating provider. And really, again, communication is key. So I'll give some examples of some real-time communication that has been helpful in the practice of taking care of a complex IBD patient. So in the preoperative phase for ulcerative colitis, there's often the decision of when do we operate or when should we escalate medical management. So for example, this is an email I received from the gastroenterologist before I go see the patient and says, you know, thank you for seeing this patient. They've been on a number of medications which they have failed to mirror, remicade, and now Intivio. They're on Intivio and prednisone. Here's the workup I've done. Do you need anything else? So then I can walk into the patient room knowing the background and discuss with the patient they are likely going to need colectomy. So that's the preoperative communication in real time. Similarly, postoperative communication I think is equally important. So after a case, I will email the treating gastroenterologist and tell them what I found, what I did, and hope that this facilitates really optimizing postoperative treatment. So in this case, I had finished a case, I sent an email to the gastroenterologist that the patient underwent a pouch excision, had extensive disease, a fibrotic pelvis, had a lot of small bowel removed proximal to the pouch, this patient should likely not have an operation again if we can possibly avoid it, and is now has 250 centimeters of remaining bowel. So it sets the context to directly communicate back with the gastroenterologist of what we found in the operating room. And hopefully this can really optimize or further optimize patient care. Similarly, I think it's really helpful that we review films with radiologists. And this helps facilitate preoperative knowledge of anatomy for the surgeons and also understands for the gastroenterologists are any further tests necessary before escalating medical therapy. So it's really useful for both gastroenterologists and surgeons. So an example, here's a patient who had a pouchogram. They have a stricture above their pouch. And we knew going into the case, we could likely perform a strictureoplasty given this was a very short segment stricture. And radiologists have also uh, given us feedback that they really appreciate hearing back from us after a case. So this is an example, it's a pelvic MRI of a pouch patient who had a fistula, and the radiologist really couldn't decipher if the fistula was coming from the anal canal or the anastomosis, and the length of the rectal cuff. Some qualities that are important to understand prior to the operation. So we did the operation, and we found the location of the fistula tract and looked at the rectal cuff, and after the case, called the radiologist back, went over the film again together, the pelvic MRI, and both of us had the opportunity to really gain knowledge and expertise both in reading MRI, both of us did. And so this then facilitates better care, again, of the patient, and better care for your next operation. So what about multidisciplinary IBD clinics? So in an ideal world, we would all have IBD clinics where both gastroenterologists and surgeons were in the same physical space, uh, we had a synchronous schedule, and we could then have further discussion, optimize our patient care. And while that may not be possible in some locations, you can also consider this also a virtual space. So the gastroenterologist and the surgeon have a discussion prior to seeing the patient, have same-day consultations as needed, and it also works that way in the post-operative period too, or are they going to be on post-operative prophylaxis? So again, having discussions when the patients come back for their post-operative visit. 
It also allows research coordinators to be immediately available for the ongoing clinical trials that either GI or surgery may be involved in. So an example of this is, I actually had this patient I saw yesterday morning in clinic prior to coming here. And this was a patient who had come in, she was a 20-year-old female, actually didn't have the diagnosis of Crohn's before she came in, was just having significant abdominal pain. So she came in and a number of tests were ordered and the gastroenterologist uh, had gone through the tests and they called me and said, can you come over and see this patient? So I went over and we had a joint discussion. We went through the imaging together. We called radiology, got on the phone with them. All three of us had a discussion and then both the gastroenterologist and myself were able to go into the patient room and have a discussion with the patient. So as you might imagine, I think this really facilitates optimizing patient care, and I think that the patient then also has a better experience when both the gastroenterologist and surgeon are able to go have a discussion together with the patient and tell her she will likely be on medical therapy for a few months, will re-image her, and then consider surgery. But then she has the whole plan in place and the timeline of what to expect. And then what about multidisciplinary IBD conferences? So these have facilitated real true learning, I think, across disciplines. And a number of institutions are starting to have this. We've started this about a year ago at our, at our own institution. And we have representatives from gastroenterology, our colorectal surgeons, a pathologist is there, and a radiologist is there. And it's really a forum to discuss challenging diagnostic cases, uh, preoperative evaluation, patients that have both medical and surgical issues, and it allows the surgeons to learn from the gastroenterologist as to their thought process and how they're treating these patients, and it allows the gastroenterologist to learn from us about what our operative plan would be. And then it also, as an example, allows us to have come back after the case and show the gastroenterologist what we found at the time of the operation, appreciate extent of disease, and enables conversation about post-operative management. So I think this is really a good forum for all disciplines to learn from one another. So in summary, uh, many institutions now are adopting a patient-centered, multidisciplinary, and collaborative approach to the patient care of IBD. And this is really important, I think, as the disease severity increases and these patients become increasingly complex. There are several issues affecting perioperative management that warrant an individualized approach while adhering to best practice guidelines. And the optimal management of patients and IBD is likely achieved through real-time communication. So it's either picking up the phone, it's sending an interportal message, or ideally having these clinics set up where we can facilitate discussion prior to making a plan for the patient. And then the multidisciplinary IBD conferences are really meant to, as a way to enhance our learning from other providers and allow gastroenterologists to learn from surgeons and vice versa and for us to all learn from radiologists and pathologists and really synthesize the information in a multidisciplinary fashion that goes into taking care of these patients when they really deserve an optimal treatment approach. Thank you.